Well, once again, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is actually the second time I've done this. The first time I messed up, I had to re-record it. I was dressed much nicer in the first video, but that's the way it is. But the editing, you'll never know. Kind of like Ashley's video. You didn't see any editing at all. But I'm so glad that you're here with us. I, I want to tell you about a, a story. Uh, author Jack Canfield wrote a story. And I've heard it before, and it's a, it's, it's a good story because he's driving home from work one day, and he decides to stop and watch a Little League baseball game. And he sits down in the, in the bleachers behind the dugout, and he, and, he, and he says to one of the boys sitting there, he said, hey, what's, what's the score? And the boy said, we're losing 14 to nothing. And he kind of looks at him and says, well, doesn't that kind of make you depressed? Doesn't that kind of worry you? And the little boy said, no, I'm not discouraged at all. We haven't even been up to bat yet. You see, today we're going to continue in this series called Epic Fails. And we're discovering together as followers of Jesus that we can find confidence for all the times in life when we face uh, failure. And through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and our past, present, and future do not need to rob us of our present and future possibilities. We see in the Bible examples of how God's grace can be found in the midst of failure. Staying with the sports analogy, the grace of God is a game changer. Grace is unearned, unending, undeserved, yet undeniable and unrelenting love of God, freely given in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This love changes the game. No matter what the scoreboard says, the game isn't over until God gets up to bat. 2,000 years ago on a on the Friday when Jesus died on the cross, hope seemed lost. But God hadn't gotten up to bat yet. And on the very first Easter Sunday, God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And through the resurrection of Jesus, sin and death and evil were defeated. The Apostle Paul said this, hope will not lead to disappointment, even when it seems that trouble is winning. We don't have to lose heart. We trust that God is soon getting up to bat. This means that even today, on, on this day, when we're confronted with disease, injustice, division, and our own personal list of troubles, evil, sin, and death has not won. Who has victory in his hands? Well, Jesus does. Because Jesus lives, we can live eternal life to the fullest, beginning right now. We are the people entrusted with the news to share with others who may be ready to give up. We need to share that the game is not over until God gets up to bat. We need to, this hope today, right? Right now, from our outward circumstances, it, it seems though, well, that trouble is winning. But that's not the whole story. Why? The Lord is still on his throne. God's getting up to bat. That's why. And we're in this series called Epic Fails. Sometimes failure has to do with our inner world. I mean, the state of our soul. We, we talked about that last week. And today we're going to take another look at something, another type of failure that is when things outside of us, outside of our control, let us down. Circumstances of life can change in an instant. And they can often fail us. This could be due to the death of a loved one, a job loss, a divorce, bankruptcy, or even a global pandemic. All are disruptive in life and can cause that. Today we're going to look at a story found in the Old Testament, Book of Ruth. It's a little book, and we meet a woman named Naomi whose life is falling apart around her. She endures loss after loss. Her dreams are dashed and her very future is at stake. Naomi's epic fail is not of her own doing, but the events and the circumstances around her. Naomi's story and her trouble begins when a famine comes to her home. 
And she is forced to move with her husband and two sons across the Dead Sea to Moab, or the present day Jordan. And this was far away from home, from her, from her extended family, her support network. The, the famine drove her small family to move to a foreign land full of people who worshiped a, a pagan god. And her safety net, her neighbors, her extended family, her small group, her family of faith, her synagogue, her church, were gone. Things then go from bad to worse after her move. Look with me at the story in Ruth 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Malon and Kilion died. And this left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. You see, things are beyond her control and circumstances around her are failing. First, she has endured the famine and then moving away from home to a strange new place, away from everybody she knew. Then her husband dies. And tragically, both of her sons die 10 years later. And Naomi has endured loss after loss and in addition to the grief she's feeling. Naomi is now in serious trouble. Childless widows in foreign lands away from their extended family and tribe did not fare well. She was destitute and now her very life is in danger. It looks as though this is the end of the story and her life would be lost. But don't put a period where God gets a comma. This is only a detour and a delay in her story. See, God hasn't gotten up to bat yet. We learn that the title character of the book, Ruth, another woman, Orpah, were married to Naomi's two sons. And since they were from Moab, when their husbands died, they could legally return to their nearby families and start over, uh, be cared for and have a future, and even remarry. And this is what Orpah does, leaving Ruth alone with Naomi, and Naomi insists that she leave and go on with her life. But despite Naomi's demands, Ruth refused to go. Instead, Ruth goes against everything in her culture. And instead, she lives into her name, which actually means lovely friend. And when Naomi persists in telling Ruth to leave, we have one of the most profound statements of friendship and loyalty, not, not only in scripture, but in all of human literature. Look with me at Ruth 1, 16 through 18. It says, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. See, Ruth would have nothing to do with Naomi's encouragement for her to return to her parents and remarry. She was in a friendship with Naomi for the long haul. And Ruth was even willing to suffer with her dear friend. She understood what Paul would write centuries later when he said to Christ's followers should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And this is exactly what Naomi needed in Ruth. When Ruth uh, 1, 20 and through 22, we see just how much uh, pain Naomi is experiencing. Listen to how Naomi feels about herself and her situations. It says, don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made my life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. 
So Naomi is ready to change her name to Mara, which it means bitter. Life has become bitter for her. And the bitterness is made worse by her, her faulty beliefs about God. She reasons that her trouble is because the Lord has caused her to suffer and sent tragedy upon tragedy. And it's hard not to be bitter if you think God has singled you out for some special course of suffering. Until the ministry of Jesus, even among some persons of faith, suffering was explained as simple cause and effect, reasoning. It, it, if something bad happened, God simply got the blame. It was a worldview of theology, a, a, a simple paint by numbers, if you will. And what's the problem with this view? Well, let's cut to the chase and just say, according to the Bible and the life and ministry of Jesus, it's just plain wrong. And this is not confined to history. I mean, I hear people still today say things that are just plain wrong. They go like this, maybe. I, I, I guess God is punishing me. Well, yes, God disciplines his children, but no earthly father would give someone cancer to teach them to learn to pray more or let them be abused to teach them patience. Even the first disciples had this wrong. In John's biography of Jesus, we find a story about when Jesus and the disciples encounter a man born blind. And with the over-simplistic understanding, they ask Jesus the wrong question. They say this in John 9, verses 2 through 11. It says, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. So let me be clear. Why is is not the wrong question, and it's one I've asked, and you've probably asked along with Naomi when she felt life was falling apart. But the second question is filled with false assumptions about God, and it only adds to the suffering of the man in, in, in their very midst. Was, was it because of our own sins or their parents' sins? They reason that if this guy has been suffering since birth, God must be after somebody, either him or his parents. And Jesus immediately corrects their false assumption by making it clear that there's no easy, simple connections and conclusions between sickness and sin or suffering and the perfect will of God. This man is a victim of blindness. But the blindness is in no way some kind of divine justice for the sin of this man or his family. Nor is God trying to teach him a lesson or singling him out for a special affliction, as Naomi believes about herself. And when suffering comes crashing into our lives, well, we can be like the disciples and even Naomi as we try to make sense of things. And in my own journey, I've realized suffering and agonizing is complex. Yes, sometimes we suffer because you and I make bad decisions about our lives. Yes, and sometimes we suffer because others make bad decisions that dramatically affect our lives. But in the study of suffering, there's two reasons that, well, these are just two entry courses. In everyone's life, there are some situations that are not easily explained. There are times when that, that, that suffering seems so unexplainable and we can only join the cry of the ages and ask why. In this conversation with the disciples, Jesus gives us a no theological explanation for suffering. And instead, Jesus corrects the false assumption. He assures them that even in this trouble, it's not God's design, but God will be glorified. That's not the end of the Jesus lesson. Instead of answering the why question, Jesus takes action. And the real question when suffering comes is not why, but now what? When it comes to suffering, there's, there's much we don't know. What we do know is that God doesn't cause all things. To blame God for COVID-19 or any other tragedy that comes at the hands of a broken world and a broken people or a broken systems, well, it's a leap in fatalism, not in faith. God does not cause all things, but God can use all things to his glory. Look with me at what Paul declares in Romans 8, 28. It says, 
And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So let's not quote just the first few words, and we know that God causes everything. That's not the end. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. God is the author of life, not death. He's the author of healing, not disease. God is the author of order, not chaos. God is the giver of joy, not bitterness. Jesus, half-brother James, declares in James 1.17, it says, Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. You know, before my father died, when I was only 18, he was, he was only 63. He'd been sick for about three years and uh, he couldn't work anymore. He was a hardworking uh, farmer who worked seven days a week. But now being sick, he could not work. So he started coming to church. And he started reading his Bible. And God used this illness that he had to go through to bring him close. So my dad got to know who Jesus was before he died. Okay, let's go back to our story. Naomi, the woman in our story today, she could use some encouragement. Bitter Naomi needs to, uh, to learn from, to live with the questions. And thankfully, her loyal friend Ruth will help her. As the story continues, their relationship deepens. Uh, Naomi begins to call Ruth my daughter. Since Naomi can't convince Ruth to return to her family, the pair journey together back to Naomi's hometown where the famine had lifted. Now, where is Naomi from? You'll never guess what town. God is going to work all things together for the good of those two women who love the Lord and are loved by Him. You see, Naomi is from Bethlehem. Yes, the, the same old little town of Bethlehem where a thousand years later Jesus will be born. Just to survive, Ruth takes up the menial job of gleaning in the fields of a wealthy man named Boaz. And for Jews, uh, gleaning was established as a, a way for persons who were poor to help themselves. The harvesters of the crop were required to leave the corners of the field unharvested so people could harvest them for their families during times of poverty. For Ruth to stick with Naomi meant that she was entering into her poverty. Now, Boaz takes notice of Ruth and is very kind to her, inviting her to harvest as much grain as she wanted and to drink water from, from his well. And the incredible kindness of a Moab, Moabite in Bethlehem, Ruth asks Boaz, why is he being so kind to her? And listen to his response in Ruth 2, verses 11 through 12. It says, yes, I know what Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and your mother and your own land and to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. See, God does work all things for the good of both Ruth and Naomi. Boaz is a distant relative of Naomi's late husband and Ruth marries Boaz and Naomi is cared for, but not only that, Ruth and Boaz have a child. Naomi joined in caring for the boy as he grew up, and the child's name was Obed, and he had a child named Jesse, who had several sons, the last of and youngest being a shepherd boy that would become King David, a man after God's own heart, whose hometown of Bethlehem will be known as the city of David. And generations later, some shepherds just outside of town will be visited by an angel who announces the, to the terrified group in Luke 1, verses 10 and 11, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So Naomi's life had fallen apart. Famine, the move to Moab, the loss of her husband, her two sons, her other daughter-in-law, and then she returns to Bethlehem with Ruth 
Ruth and Boaz's marriage, the birth of a child who would be the grandfather of, of King David and whose family Jesus came from. Wow, what can we say? Can God use some things for good? We can certainly say that God is good. Yes, God caused all things to work together for good. Now, it looked for a time like Naomi would die a destitute widow in a foreign land. And God's goodness was revealed through a lovely friend named Ruth. And she is a hero in this story simply because she was a friend. When life was bitter for her friend Naomi, Ruth refused to leave her alone. When life's circumstances became an epic fail that threatened to leave us bitter, a loyal friend changes everything. So here's today's sermon in a, in a sentence. When life is bitter, I need a friend. And Ruth is that kind of friend in this story. She gives us a sneak peek into the very character of her coming descendant, our Savior Jesus. And today, Jesus wants to be your friend. He calls his disciples in the Bible and us today his friends. What a friend we have in Jesus. And in life, especially when our circumstances in life fail us, we, we need to be like those persons, like we need to be persons like Ruth that can be Jesus with skin on to someone else. We need to, well, let me say, we need to be someone for someone else. The kind of friend that, that has that loyalty and that stick to itiveness to say, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. A real friend is one who comes whenever everybody else is running out. A real friend sticks closer than a brother or a sister. A friend in bitter times of trouble makes all the difference. One last story. During uh, World War II, the Nazi controlled Bulgaria. There was a Christian pastor there named uh, Metropolitan Kirill. And when the Nazis began to round up the Jewish people in the city, this pastor decided to act. And as a train was being packed with 8,500 Jews on their way to an extermination camp in Poland, Nazi soldiers could not believe what took place next. Emerging from the darkness, wearing his customary mitter, the hat worn by the Orthodox priest, along with his long black robe and his beard flowing down, the tall metropolitan Kirill emerged along with 300 of his church members. And he confidently pushed his way through the armed guards into the holding area filled with Jewish men and women and children. He then lifted his hands and shouted the words from the book of Ruth, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And he even threatened to lay down on the train tracks to stop the train from moving. Well, the Nazis let the people go. As news of this action spread, the nation of Bulgaria was changed. 42 parliament members rebelled against their government and the deportations of Jews was halted. Before World War II, there were 48,000 Jews living in Bulgaria. At the end of the war, there was 50,000. The only country with more Jewish persons alive at the end of the war than at the start of the war. These Christians saved the lives of tens of thousands of Jewish persons by being a friend in time of trouble. They're honored in the Holocaust Museum in Israel as righteous among nations. If you don't have a friend like that, I want to encourage you to risk connecting with some other followers of Jesus who are a part of Grace Church. We, we have some small groups and, and, and we'd like to launch some more. If you can't find one that fits you, start your own. I will help you. I'd love to help you take the next steps in connecting with other people. Simply text the word next to the number that's on your screen. 
Today, someone is watching that may need Jesus as a friend. Someone who's never given their life to him and is not walking with him. If that's you, please text the word yes to the number that's on the screen. You see, when life is bitter, we need a friend. Let's go to our friend Jesus right now in prayer. Well, Father, what a friend we have in Jesus. Lord, you care so much for us that you even died on a cross to save us. Lord, you took all our sin. You made us right with God so that we can live in eternity. And Lord, right now I know that you're tugging at a heart of someone watching. Someone out there is saying, I need a friend. Lord, let them see that you are that friend. Let them see that they only need to text that word yes. Let them see that they can be connected to our Grace Church family, that they can have friends like we have friends here. Lord, thank you that in the epic fails of life that are beyond our control, you're still there. Thank you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Amy's going to do one more song for us, and, and I encourage you to take some time maybe to pray. And once again, if you have said yes, make sure that you let me know. I want to give you some next steps. I'm going to get you a Bible if you don't have one. I want to let you know where you can fit in at Grace Church. All right. Amy, play for us.